Thank you very much. Um, I should start uh, with thanks and apologies. So thanks for the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me to the great place. Um, when I got the invitation from uh, Jean-Francois um, and Francois, uh, they forgot to mention that how great this, how nice this place was. Um, if, if, they, if they told me, perhaps I would have come uh, for a longer period. Um, unfortunately, I'm organizing, as, I, as we speak, another meeting in Durham. So I should be in Durham, uh, back in the north of England. Uh, um, and I'm hoping that they will not notice my uh, absence. Actually, I will be quite upset if they don't notice my absence, but then there's another story. Um, OK, so um, it's a great place, and it's great to be here. Um, and I, looking at the audience and the people that came uh, uh, to the talk, I uh, feel uh, overdressed. And I apologize for that. You know, Darum uh, has a different climate from the climate here. Um, it is true that uh, Peter offered his shorts uh, this morning, but I uh, uh, politely refused that. So um, there you are. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kubature methods. Um, of course, in one hour, it would be uh, quite difficult to go into any depth uh, for, um, to explain Kubature methods. But what I'll try to do, I'll try to just give you the, fla the flavor of, uh, of the subject and uh, sort of tell you, you know, the, the message um, is that uh, Kubitscher methods are uh, a very versatile methodology that can be used to uh, solve a variety of PDEs and stochastic PDEs. And the common uh, the denominator of all these PDEs and stochastic PDEs um, are feynman kass representations. Indeed, you know, many, many of these uh, PDEs uh, admit a feynman kass representation. And once you have a feynman kass representation, you are in business. There's lots of things that you could do. Uh, once you have a feynman kass representation, you can, you can go ahead and I have two hours. Two hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. So, well, <laughs> I was surprised to uh, be introduced to have a course of one hour, but you know, you never know. So, will I be able to have a break in between? Sure, sure. Excellent. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, um, OK, coming back to uh, uh, the two hours lecture, right? Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so, the common denominator of, of uh, everything that I'm going to tell you, as I said, is a Feynman Kass representation. And it's, uh, it's, an, amazing, uh, it's an amazing object um, for many reasons. And, and the, the, once you have a Feynman Kass representation, you can go and analyze the equation. Uh, from a theoretical perspective, you can, you can say, well, OK, so what can we say about the equation uh, once you have this presentation, uh, representation? And you can, you can analyze its smoothness. Uh, but you can do a lot more. Uh, you, what you, uh, as, as I will point out, uh, you can try and say, OK, suppose you have a feynman kass representation. Suppose you start with a feynman kass representation, then how do you, uh, can, can you show that the equation has a solution in some sense? And I'll, I'll say a little bit about this. Um, but because it's a core, this, this, is, this is a school on numerics, uh, I will talk mostly about how you use the Feynman Kass representation in order to do numerics. And this is where uh, uh, cubature methods uh, uh, become very powerful. And the reason why they become very powerful uh, is that. As, as you will see, um, they are all, all of these Feynman Kass representations have a common denominator, and this is Brownian motion. And the Kubitschel method simply is a method that provides an approximation of the winner measure. And in all of the examples that I'm going to present um, next, uh, what you will see that the, they will be the methodology has three parts. There's three steps, but somehow you do all three steps in one go. 
the first step is to replace the underlying uh, winner measure with a cubature method, me, uh, measure. And this is the, uh, this is the cubature uh, representation. Um, and then there's another step which takes the cubature measure and reduces it to a sub measure that uh, has a fixed number of puffs. And I'm going to explain that. And this is how you control the computational effort. So these two steps are common. These two steps are common to all the examples that I'm going to give you. The only, the only difference is the way in which you um, discretize, you approximate the feynman kaiser representation. If the, each of these PDEs that we, I'm going to look at, each of the uh, individual PDEs or SPDs that I'm going to look at, of course, they will have their own feynman kaiser representation. And you have to take that representation and approximate it. So the only difference, so, so the, only, the thing that is going to be different for each of the uh, examples that I'm going to show you next will be how you, you know, the, the, the actual Feynman Kaiser representation that you have and how you discretize it. And then on top of this, you, you, you use the other, two, uh, the other two steps, i.e., the approximation of the winner measure and uh, the control of the computational effort. The examples that I'm, I will present will be, um, so I have three examples. So it's great that I have two hours <laughs> to go through these three examples. So the first one is semilinear PDs. And this is joint work with uh, Konstantinos Manorakis, his work that uh, we've done some time ago. So the template, the template for each of these three examples will be the same. I'm going to show you what the feynman kaiser representation is going to be. So this is going to be in terms of, four, of a forward backward stochastic differential equation. I'll tell you how you discretize, and then give you the main result, which will be the error that you get if you do this approximation, which involves these three steps, depends on, you know, come, it comes from each of the three steps, and I'll explain what uh, each of the three steps uh, uh, involves. And then I'm going to give you an example to, to see, you know, what sort of uh, uh, results do we get, and you know, essentially a numerical implementation. So this is the first example, the same linear PD. The second example, this is joint work with Salvatore Ortiz Latour. This is uh, for uh, linear parabolic stochastic PDs with multiplicative noise. And the reason why we look at this example is because this this type of stochastic PDs they appear uh, <clears throat> in the area of filtering. So in stochastic filtering. Uh, you deal with uh, you deal with things like uh, conditional uh, distributions of signals given observations, and the result there is that you end up with a stochastic PD, and you want to solve this PD, and very naturally you will have a feynman kaiser representation for this PD, and therefore you can use the whole methodology developed here in order to solve the PD and therefore solve the filtering problem. And the third example is the most uh, Recent uh, work, uh, which was uh, done, uh, finished last year with my student, Simon McMurray. So here, we're looking at McKean-Vlasov PDs. And here, the connections will be, the feynman kaiser representation will be in terms of a nonlinear diffusion. And again, I'm going to explain here how you, uh, discret how you discretize this nonlinear diffusion, uh, what, uh, you, what theorems are there and then a numerical representation, and then I'll, I'll complete the uh, course with some final remarks. So that's uh, essentially the, the plan for, uh, for the course. OK, so <clears throat> let, me start with, uh, let me start with this sort of general, generic uh, uh, introduction to uh, feynman kaiser representations. And um, I'm sure that uh, a, a lot of people in the audience have heard of at least the sort of general feynman kass formula for, uh, for the heat equation. Um, essentially, uh, the heat equation is not just the, the, the only equation that admits a feynman kass representation. There's a whole lot, uh, there's a whole lot of uh, equations that are out there uh, that admit a feynman kass representation. So what is a feynman kass representation? It is essentially um, a formula that, that connects that connects a, uh, the solution of a PD, the solution of an SPD, with um, a functional, with the expected value of a functional of a stochastic process. 
And you know, most of the time, you, you can reduce you can reduce this uh, you can reduce this expected value of the function of the stochastic process. The process itself uh, is Brownian motion. So um, the way in which I try to uh, sort of put this to uh, a non-special audience is that this Feynman cast representation they, they provide a dictionary, if you will, because between phenomena that happen at macroscopic level and phenomena that happen at microscopic level. And uh, because we are probabilists, because we like stochastic processes, we've learned, we know a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of things related to Brownian motion, related to stochastic processes. And the way in which we try to get to the macroscopic uh, event and the macroscopic phenomena is coming from the microscopic level upstairs. And this is really fascinating. And you know, at the, at the first sight, you know, I've, I've given here seven or eight examples of uh, PDs or SPDs that have made a feynman cas representation, OK? And at the first sight, it's really surprising to see that all of these, all of these things, and all of these things, they model uh, phenomena that you know, essentially are quite different in nature, and yet all of these things that uh, at the macroscopy level they have a common denom denominator at the microscopy level, and that this that is this object called Brownian motion. Of course, you know once once you know a little bit about this thing, you you realize that you know it's not really surprising that somehow somehow in your in your PD you have a Laplacian in these guys or it, or by itself. And then it's not surprising that there is a Brownian motion at the microscopy level that is connected to uh, all of them. So the three examples that I'm gonna, I will look at will be, are, uh, are written in red here. So for the SPD that I'm gonna look at, uh, this is uh, the Zakai equation. And the actual representation was introduced by uh, Duncan Mortens and Zakai in 1970. Uh, for the nonlinear diffusion, I'm putting here Gerdner, 1988, but I'm happy to change that uh, if uh, people think that there was an earlier representation of, uh, of this uh, mckim lasso PD in terms of a nonlinear diffusion. Um, for the semilinear PD, uh, it was Pardue and Peng that um, came up first with the uh, representation of this, of the solution of the semilinear PD in terms of four backward equation. And so basically, uh, you know, once you've seen this, then you know if there are students in the audience that might want to try other PDs using this methodology, you know, just take your pick, choose one PD which has a Feynman color representation, and see if you can do it. Cubature methods are really versatile methods that are, you know, the, the messages that they can be used to solve any of these PDs as long you have as long as you have a Feynman color representation. Okay, so let me come back to this. So. The, the, in, in abstract form, the feynman cas representation is simply the uh, expression, a representation of the solution of the PD or the SPD in terms of the expected value. Um, so this is an integral over the path space. You have to take, you take the winner measure, right? And then you have to have a functional which you integrate with respect to the winner measure on the path space where the winner measure resides on, on, the, on, the, on the set of uh, continuous paths. Uh, so, in 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 all of this in all of these PDs, the only thing that's going to be different is the functional. The winner measure is still going to be the same, and therefore, if I know, so one step in the in the one step in the approximation will be to replace the winner measure, and the cubature measure a cubature approximation a cubature method replaces the winner measure. So that is. That is where the cubicular method would, will uh, influence, will come and uh, uh, be used here. OK, so before, before I go on and tell you about the numerical approximation of these PDEs using cubicular measure, I'm on, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how you can use feynman cas representation for analyzing theoretically um, these PDEs or SPDs. And, the, the connection is really Malevan calculus. In, in effect, what you, can, what you do, you say, OK, the, if you want to analyze the smoothness of this PD, or of the, of the PD or the SPD, then you can go on and look at the smoothness of the functional, 
that appears in the Feynman Kaiser presentation in Malayavan sense. And so even though even though you sort of it's a much more complicated um, uh, methodology uh, to use Malavan differentiation, it can lead to very, very powerful uh, results. And I have a very simple, I have a very simple uh, example here uh, to, try to, sort of try to explain how exactly do you use uh, uh, Malavan integration, how exactly do you use uh, differentiation in, in, in the Malavan sense to analyze uh, to analyze the uh, differentiability of the of the PD. So, so the example is, uh, you know, the simplest possible example, the, the heat equation. And so, what you do here? So, I have the heat equation, which we all know about it. And the heat equation coming from Feynman and Katz has this Feynman Katz representation. So, uh, phi is the initial condition, and the solution at time t estimated at point x is the expected value of phi at x plus wt, where wt is the Brownian motion. So that's a feynman kaiser representation. Um, um, and we ha I have this representation in this way. It's actually quite simple to deduce this uh, representation. OK? Now, in this part, OK, so then and, then, and then once you know this thing, once you know, once you have this representation, then you can rewrite this in terms of, you are quite likely, you have an explicit uh, formula for the density of the Brownian motion. So you can write this as an integral, as an integral of phi with respect to the corresponding Gaussian density. I'm not going to look at this, but at, at this point in time, this is the representation. And then what you can do, what you can do, you can differentiate. You can differentiate this with respect to x, differentiate under the expected value, and then you can use Malayavan calculus in order to get an expression of the derivative of the PDE in this form. So it's not just that the equation itself, the solution of the equation itself, has a feynman kaiser representation, but it's also the case that all derivatives have a feynman kaiser representation. You show that all the derivatives have a feynman kaiser representation in this form. OK, and then you can say, right, uh, once I have this uh, representation for the derivatives, I can try and control the derivatives. I can try the various norms of the derivatives in terms of the property of the functional in the feynman kaiser representation. So a, a very simple example in here, once I have this representation in here, I can say, well, suppose phi, uh, suppose phi is bounded. Well, if phi is bounded, then I can say that the supremum norm of the derivative of u is bounded by the supremum norm of phi. And then what's left inside the expectation, I just get the expected value of the absolute value of the Brownian motion divided by t. And I know what is the expected value of the absolute value of the Brownian motion is, is what it is, square root of t times some constant. And then all of a sudden, I find, I find an upper bound very easily. I find an upper bound for the uh, supremum of the derivative. Of course, this is a very complicated way to compute, to uh, estimate, to find the bound for the supremum of the derivative. In this particular case, I could have looked at the fundamental solution. I could have looked at directly this representation. And then I could differentiate it. I could, I, I could have differentiated this with respect to x. And I could, I could obtain the same, I could obtain the same uh, formula by differentiating the fundamental solution. OK? So there isn't much to be gained in this particular example. But what turns out, what it turns out, it turns out that you can do the same argument for much more general setups. You can do the same argument for general uh, PDEs and SPDs. And therefore, uh, you can uh, look at the properties. So in, in general, you will never have an explicit solution. But you will still be able to apply this methodology in the Malia-Van integration in order, to, in order to get the expression for the derivative. And you can find, you can study the smoothness of the solution um, in, in, in this way. So <clears throat> this, is, this methodology was, is very powerful. And in fact, this was uh, the reason why Malia-Van introduced this, was you wanted to uh, uh, duplicate, you wanted to use a uh, uh, probabilistic methodology in order to um, show 
you know, the, uh, that uh, solution of a PDE is smooth under the hormonal condition. Um, and um, his program was, oh, sorry. His program was continuous in uh, the 80s by Kusoka and Struck. What Kusoka and Struck uh, did was to uh, take this idea and take the program further to a case when the PD is no longer, that no longer satisfies the hormonal condition. You, you, uh, you have something, you have a PD where um, uh, you, the hormonal condition is generalized to a condition which is weaker, which is called the UFG condition. Essentially, under the UFG condition, you know, you can have many PDs which are not, do not satisfy the hormonal condition, but they satisfy the UFG condition. And the same, the same methodology, the same analysis applies there. And um, you know, following their program, you can show, you can show that uh, PDs that are not necessarily, do not necessarily satisfy the hormonal condition are still smooth. They are not necessarily smooth in all the direction, but they are smooth in certain directions which are generated by a certain uh, Lie algebra. And these results that Kusoka and Struck uh, developed cannot be duplicated using PDE methods. So these results that Kusoka and Struck, you know, this, the probabilistic methodology that Kusoka and Struck introduced cannot be repeated, cannot be duplicated in using uh, standard deterministic methods, because standard deterministic methods have to survive, have to use essentially something like the hormonal condition or something that eventually leads to uh, a system that satisfies the hormonal condition. It's very powerful, it's a very powerful methodology. And you can go further, you can say, okay, now suppose, suppose I go the other way around, suppose, suppose I start with representations uh, uh, like this, is it the case that if I have a representation like this, I have a solution of the corresponding PD? So rather than going from the PD to the representation, you start with the representation and say, under what condition this representation gives me a solution of the PD? And the reason why this is powerful is because the representation in itself Right, can be defined. You can define the representation under, under very general conditions. And as a result, you can hope to show that the corresponding PD has a solution under very general conditions. And, and it, this is the case, and you can, uh, you, you can do this and show for a variety of PDs when you, can, you have no hope to show that they have a solution in uh, by using classical methods, you can use this uh, farman kaz representation to show that they uh, actually have a solution in a certain sense. So Kusoka and Struk uh, developed this program, as I said, in the 80s. Kusoka came back and, and, um, and refined um, their, their methodology in 2003. And also, uh, the whole Kubitschur methodology is based on the results that Kusoka and Struk developed. And, you know, it was unav unavoidable that once I started to look into Kubitschur methods, I realized that you know, their theoretical analysis is so powerful, it can be extended, it can be extended in a variety of situations, and um, I uh, have a number of results together with my collaborators that extends their classical results. And this is for linear PDs, this is for linear PDs, but you can go and try to repeat their programs for uh, both semi-linear PDs and this is work with Francois, and for McKinvas of uh, equations, and this is work with my students, Eamon uh, McMurray. And in, essentially, you, know, you, you have to do the theoretical analysis first before you do the numerical analysis, because the numerical analysis hinges on, uh, the numerical analysis hinges on uh, errors, or on bounds, that you have to first develop theoretically in order to use them uh, in the uh, theoretical analysis of the corresponding methodology. Okay, so <clears throat> let me go back and now uh, uh, tell you how, you know, so that was the, you know, a little bit that I wanted to say about the theoretical analysis of the PDEs. Now we move on to the numerical analysis of these PDEs based on the feynman kaz representation. So let me, I'm gonna go back and say, right, um, 
I know, suppose I know that I have my PD or SPD, and this PD or SPD has a Feynman Kass representation. In other words, in other words the, the, I can represent it, the solution of the PD or SPD at time t estimated at point x is written as an integral over the winner space of some functional integrated with respect to the winner measure. How do I use this representation in order to produce an approximation? And it's actually, you know, if, if you think about this, it's, it's, it's you know, very intuitive. What you need to do, you need to approximate everything you see inside. So you have to, first of all, approximate the winner measure. So the winner measure is a very complicated uh, object that works on, is, is defined on, on, the, on the space of continuous paths, and it's actually very, very difficult to work with the winner measure in itself, okay? So one way to do that is to just sample from the winner measure, and I'll come back to this. Um, we don't want to sample from the winner measure. That's the message, that sampling, sampling from the winner measure can be, uh, you know, it's better to use a curvature method uh, rather than sample from the winner measure. Now the next step would be to get the, this representation that you end up in uh, uh, the Feynman Kass representation, the functional, and try to discretize it, try to, try to replace it by something which is a lot more amenable for numerical approximation. Okay, so, and this step, this step is the step that is different for every case that you look at. So what's gonna be common will be the uh, uh, approximation of the winner measure, and the way in which you control the computational effort, and what is gonna be different in each of the cases is how do you actually, uh, how do you actually approximate the, the, the um, functional. Okay, so these are the first two steps, so, and then, so I'm right, this is what I'm saying in here, they, it's a three-step scheme, but you know, it, you'll not see three steps when you implement this, you do it, everything in one go. So uh, step one, part one, replace the winner measure with another measure which is gonna be discrete, is this is a measure on the space of paths, so we're gonna deal with a collection of paths, right? And so this is, the me this is gonna be a measure which will correspond to a, a, another process which I'll call it W tilde, and this process W tilde will approximate in some way the winner process, the, the Brownian motion. And then the next, the next step, as I said, is just sort of, is gonna be to replace the uh, functional with a simpler version that we, we, you will be able to integrate with respect to this simplified winner measure. And then the final step will be to say, okay, so I have all of this, I have all of this place, I have, I have those, all these steps is in place, but then I know that my uh, laptop or my desktop or my uh, parallel computing uh, machine cannot afford more than this amount of computational effort. That means that I, am not, I cannot have more than uh, 100,000 paths. Now how do I sam sa sample from this, from this simplified measure so that I can, my computational effort is kept fixed? And this is, uh, so this you have to, con you can control the computational effort we're using a methodology which we developed uh, uh, for a different reason. I'll come back to this and we call it the uh, TBBA, the tree-based branching algorithm. And uh, it was a very unfortunate name because people are used to with much more uh, appealing names of divide and conquer, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, it didn't take off, we think, because of that. Okay, so. Uh, before I go on and, and explain the cubature method, I have, uh, I have a sort of a, a nice representation here to try to explain what cubature measure actually does. So what I have in here, what I have in here, I have uh, a, a numerical, uh, so I have 10 independent Brownian paths. Okay, so you can, you can think of this independent Brownian paths, these are the typical paths typical paths for the winner measures. If you sample from the winner measure, you get paths that look like this. Okay, so what you could do, you could say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna replace my winner measure here with, with a measure which sits on these 10 independent uh, Brownian paths. So it's a, it's a, this is a normal, normal uh, nominal uh, Monte Carlo approximation for, for such an expected uh, value of a functional with respect to the winner measure. That's fine. Okay, uh, the way, so this is, what you see in here, these are typical paths. 
A curvature measure doesn't use this typical pass. A curvature measure uses something which I call representative paths. So what you so the, the, the a representative path doesn't is nowhere near a typical path. A representative paths is example of representative paths are paths that are piecewise linear. Paths that are piecewise linear. Okay? So in what way these paths that are piecewise linear, in what way do they approximate this typical path? You know, in, in what way a measure that resides on paths that look like this approximates the, the winner measure? Well, the common denominator for this is, uh, is the signature of the winner measure, the signature of the, of the Brownian motion, the signature of a path. So what I'll point out is that you know, the, these paths and these paths, they share a part of their signature. And I'll explain what signature means, but for the moment, you know, the way in which I sort of go and uh, try to explain the, the, what, what this means to a, a non-specialist audience is by means of a comparison with DNA. Because you go and, you know, if you, uh, I'm sure the same uh, thing applies here in France. Uh, in, in Britain, if you want to go and uh, explain to uh, people that uh, want to give you some money uh, to fund your research, they, they come to you and say, Mr. Bloch comes to you and say, well, okay, can you explain to me in 500 words or less, with no mathematics, what it is that you want uh, to do with our money? And so you try to find out, uh, you try to find out an explanation which doesn't use any mathematics, and the one that I was, wh I was using was to uh, say, well, okay, so think that you want to find out uh, uh, details about sort of human beings, how they evolve, how they, uh, how they behave. So obviously what they have in common is the DNA, right? But of course you don't want to do any experiments on, on the full DNA, so you try to uh, uh, use things that sort of take part of the DNA you look, at, uh, you look at approximations, so for example, you could look at mice and you can study mice, and the connection is gonna be that mice and men, they share part of the DNA. There's a truncated part uh, that is common to both uh, mice and men, and then you do, the, you do your experience, you do, you do your uh, study on mice. And um, sometimes this is a success, successful, they like it, sometimes they don't. Um, I tried it on my kids as well, and my kids liked it very much. Um, and uh, when I explained them, you know, this comparison with mice and men, uh, the next day my kids came to me and said, okay, daddy, we wanna come, we wanna study cubicle measures. And I was very uh, pleased with that. And then they said, we wanna come to uh, see your office. And I didn't realize uh, why they wanted to come to see my office, but I said, well, you know, who am I to, uh, 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 not to try to educate my kids? So I took them to my office, and they were very disappointed because they were expecting to see lots of mice. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, and then uh, they said they decided that actually they don't like visual measuring. But anyway, so coming back to uh, the story here is that um, a cubature measure produces paths that resembles, resemble, a, uh, resemble a Brownian path uh, through its signature. So what is the signature of a path? So the way in which this is presented, it's, it's a very abstract way, is, uh, is in terms uh, of a tensile algebra or non commutative uh, polynomials, but I'm not gonna go into all of these things. It, it came, so it, it comes out of the work of Chen. You know, so to try to explain it directly, what you do, you take a path, so suppose you have a path which has bounded variation, and you compute all the iterated integrals of this path. Okay, so, so you know, assume that you are in RD, you have a path in RD, and then what you do, you compute all of the iterated integrals, first order, second order, third order, and so on, of this path, all the iterated integrals that involve all the components of the path. And there are lots of them. And then you take all these iterated integrals and you, you put them, you put them in, in, in separate boxes, right? And you obtain a, a, a massive, massive objects that makes a record, record of all these iterated integrals, right? So you can, you can write you can write all this, you can sum them up in direct sum because there's no proper summation in there, and that's the signature of the path. So, you know, it's in, 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 
In, in terms that get away from algebra, the signature of a path is, is an object that makes a record of all the iterated integrals of the path. And, and of course, you'll have to make sure that these iterated integrals make sense. And of course, if the path has bounding variation, the, the iterated integrals will make sense. So the signature of a path, once again, is an object, it's an algebraic object that makes a record of all the iterated integrals of, of the path, all the components, iterated integrals of all, all the components of the path. So that's the signature of a path with bounding variation. And then the next thing that you can do is to truncate this object, right? So remember, you know, eventually I'm only gonna be, I'm only gonna care about the, 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 the truncated signature. So to truncate this object, you just say, okay, I'm not gonna be interested to compute all the iterated integrals of all the orders. I'm only gonna be interested to compute the iterated integrals up to some order m. So the signature is, contains all the iterated integrals. The truncated signature up to order m contains all the iterated integrals up to order m. Okay, so that's, that's what you have when you take a bounding variation path. And then what you can do, you can say, okay, how about Brownian motion? Well, so your path doesn't have to have, your path doesn't have to be deterministic, it can be random. We can look at the signature of Brownian motion, and in order to define the signature of Brownian motion, you do the same thing. You take all the iterated integrals of a Brownian path, but here, the iteration, the, the integration is in Stratonovich sense. So this, this so, so there is a reason for that, so you work with the Stratonovich um, integral, but there is, there is the, um, you, you can either order Satonovich or Ito integration. You know, that's the, uh, that's the what one to one correspondence. Okay? So, so you have a signature of a Brownian path as well as a signature, as a, a signature of a bounding variation path as well as a signature of the Brownian path. And you can take the Brownian path, uh, the Brownian signature, and truncate it. Yeah. Uh, I don't see exactly uh, what is the object d omega d1 tensorial d omega d okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is, so what you're trying to avoid the fact that you have to take all the components, right? So, so basically when you, so suppose you have, you, you have omega has two components. Right? So this thing with omega has two components is a matrix that has, you know, here, integral of omega one with respect to omega one, integral of omega one with respect to omega two, integral of omega two with respect to omega one, and so on. So you, it, you, you get an array, you get an array which contains all the integral uh, of each component. So this is for a two-dimensional, this is for iterated integral of order two. When you go to order three, then you have a cube. Order four, you have a hypercube and so on. And the easiest way to use, the easiest way to express this is to use, to use this tensor product between them. Right. So, <clears throat> so as I said, I'm trying to avoid algebra here, right? Because we are analysts. And so the best way to, to think of this is, is to just take all the iterated integrals between all the possible components up to all orders, and that's the signature. And then if you want to truncate it, you just take iterated integrals between components up to some order m. And you do the same thing for Brownian motion as you do it for a, pound, a path with bounded variation. Okay. So it turns out that, that it turns out that signature, the signature of a path is a very powerful object effectively the signature of the path identifies the, the path. And there are theorems developed uh, in rough path theory. This is the basis of rough path theory. It comes from the development of rough path theory uh, 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 that started with the work with Terry Lyons and continued uh, in, in, sort of in, in recent years with many, many other people that do rough path theory. And the uh, you know, culmination of this is, is the work by Martin Herrer that got his Fields Medal, using rough path theory, he showed that you have solutions of certain SPDs uh, and you can interpret them as rough paths. So very powerful, it's a very powerful methodology and the basis of all this 
is this concept of a, of a signature. We don't need rough paths in order to uh, do cubature methods. The only common, uh, the, the, the common part between rough path theory and cubature method is this notion of, of signature. So if you start with a signature of the path, right, the signature of the path identifies the path. Up to a certain, uh, up to a certain class, uh, if you know the signature of the path, you know the path. But there's more. If you have a process, if you have a process, if you, if you put, if you, if you start with a, uh, with a measure on, uh, on the winner, uh, on a set of continuous path, and you look at the corresponding process and you are able to compute uh, the expected value of the signature of the process, this quantity identifies the, the law of the process. So if you have two different processes that uh, have the same signature, they will have the same law. Okay, so in particular, if you have a process, you, it's quite easy to compute the signature of the winner measure, because you know how to compute, we know how to compute the expected value of iterative integrals of Brownian motion. That's easy. Everybody knows this. So if you, you, know, you compute these things, any other process that has the same signature, any other process for which the corresponding expected value of, of the iterative integrals will be the same as the expected value of the iterative integrals of Brownian motion, will have the same law. That's fine. But now let's suppose that you take another process that matches the expected value of its signature, not for all iterated integrals, not the entire signature, but the truncated signature. So you say, OK, I'm taking a process, I'm taking a process that if I compute the corresponding expected value of the signature, the truncated signature, it, marks, match, it matches the, expect, the truncated uh, expected value of the, uh, of the signature of Brown emotion. What can you say about the corresponding laws? And it turns out that the corresponding laws are very close. It turns out that, that if, you take, if you take a functional of that process, the expected value of the functional of that process uh, is very close to the expected value of the functional of Brown motion. And that's what I wanted to get to because because I want to replace the, the uh, Winder measure, I want to replace the, the Brown motion with a process, another process, okay, that will match the tranquility signature. And if I do that, what I'll end up, I'll end up with an approximation of the corresponding feynman kaiser representation. I'll end up with an approximation of the, uh, of the PD. And this approximation will be a high order approximation in the sense, in the sense that you know, the more, the more iterated, uh, the, 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 the higher the truncated signature is I'm, I'm matching, the better the approximation. And I'll come back to this. And if you want to find out conditions under, under which this is the case, I've done some work. There's been a lot of work in this direction. And if you want to find out processes that have these properties, processes that match the Brownian motion in some way, there's been a lot of work in in this direction, and you will not be surprised to see Kusoka in here. So Kusoka, obviously, you know, they, they developed the theoretical methodology, the theoretical analysis, and then they realized, he and his collaborators realized that you can then develop numerical methods that exploit this theoretical analysis. And Lyons and Victor came in 2004 and, say, and said, OK, you can do this to any order. So, so they proved the following result. They say, OK, so you start with the signature of Brownian motion. OK. You know what the, signature, the expected value of the signature of Brownian motion is. And you can construct a process right, that will, will have a finite set of outcomes. It's going to be a very simple process, a simple process. And the outcomes, the paths that this process can take, this random process can take, will be finite. And each of these paths will have bounded variations. So what you see in here, this BV, it means that the, the paths have bounded variations. Right? So this is going to be a process. It's going to, you, know, you can think of it as a, as a random process. But this random process is only allowed to take a finite, you know, so be, to, the paths of this random process will be one of a finite number, a finite set of, uh, 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 of paths with bounded variation. And so there exists a finite set of paths, say capital N paths, and there exists a process that the probability that the process takes any one of these paths 
is given by some lambda i. So there exists some uh, lambda i. The sum of the lambda i is one. So we're dealing with this is the distribution of the this is the distribution of the uh, process, and this this random process takes one of these paths, which has, has a finite variation with probability lambda i, and this this process has the property that if you compute the expected value of the truncated signature of this process, it matches the expected value of the truncated signature of the Brownian motion. And they called, they, they called the corresponding distribution of this process, the law of this process on the path space. So the law of this process on the path space is a linear combination of Dirac measure at those paths times the corresponding probability for each of those paths. So this is, this is a, a simple, uh, is the empirical distribution of this process on the, on the path space. This is called the cubature measure. Yeah. The sequence of the sequence of the eyes. This one. Here, on the piece of, on the previous page. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh so that's ah, I see. So this is just. This is just a notation to uh, integrate on, on, the, on the simplex. So, so that simply means, so the first order, right, the first order is just omega t1. The second order is and the third order, so you, so you just integrate, you just integrate on the simplex. That's what that's, the, the, that integral simply means this, 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 this type of iterated integrals. So that's simply a notation for this iterated integrals. So t1, t2 are sort of the dummy variable with respect to which I integrate. I'll, I'll get there. Okay. I'll get there. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what they have, what Lyons and Victor uh, have, is, is, is sort of sort of an existence result. They say, if you start with the Brownian motion, you truncate the Brownian motion. There is there exi there, there exists this finite variation uh, paths, so that the corresponding uh, measure, the corresponding measure. Is a cubature measure in the sense of the expected value of the truncated signature of this new process coincides with the expected value of the truncated signature of the Brownian motion. And you know, for from now on, I'm going to call I'm going to call by Q T M the signature, the you know, the, the cubature measure for where M is the truncation uh, parameter. So that means that you match all the iterated integrals up to the level n. So m can be one. That means you just match the first, just match the, the iterated integrals of order one, two, order two, three, order three, and, and, and so on. OK. So, right, so suppose you have such a truncated measure. You know, how do you actually use if you have if you suppose, suppose you have such a truncated cubature, how do you actually use it? Okay, so so the this, the simplest example is to look and see what happens. How do I use it in order to compute the expected value of a function of a diffusion? Right at the end of the day, a diffusion you can think you think of you can think of a diffusion as being as being a function of the Brownian path, right? And how do I use this, the, the cubature measure, in order to compute the expected value of a function, of another function of the Brownian path? 
So, you know, you start with a standard SD, you have a standard SD, well, which is driven by, so, you know, it's in any dimension you want, and it's driven by a d dimensional Brownian motion, okay? And I want to compute the expected value, I want to compute the expected value of a function of this SD. So this is a standard uh, problem which appears in many, many applications, right? But from the perspective of a Feynman cast representation, it's a fun, this, you know, this, this particular expression is a fun, Feynman cast representation that can be used to represent uh, the solution of a linear PD. Right? So exactly what I'm doing here, I'm solving a linear PD by using a probabilistic this prob this Feynman cast representation. Okay? So how do I use the how do I use the, the cubature measure in order to produce an approximation of this linear PD? Okay, so again, the reason why I'm gonna be able to use it is because is because you know, you, you know at, at some level the solution of X is a function of the Brownian path. Okay? And it's, it's, it's driven by the Brownian path. Okay? So suppose you have one of these cubicular measures that sits on, that you have one of these cubicular measures that sits on a number of finite variation paths, omega i. So what you do, you, you take each one of these paths and you solve the SD, but instead of solving the SD with respect to the corresponding with respect to the Brownian motion, you replace the Brownian motion with the corresponding path. So you replace the Brownian motion with the corresponding path. This is gonna be an integral now, no longer a stochastic integral, but uh, an integral with respect to a finite variation process, okay? And you solve for each of those paths in the supports of the curvature, you, sup you, you solve the corresponding ODE now, right? Which is driven by this path. Right, so, so you know, you have one solution of the OD for each of the paths in your cubicular measure. Right? You solve the OD, right? And then you're saying, okay, now that I solve my OD, how am I going to approximate the functional? Okay, I need to compute the expected value, I need to compute the expected value of my functional of the solution, but now the solution is only uh, uh, is only integrated on those paths. So what you do, you take. I'm sorry about this. So so, so what what this means? What this is? This should be alpha. So you you take you estimate alpha your function at the solution of the ODE, and you take the linear combinations of these guys, multiply by the corresponding probability for each of those paths. So put it differently, you integrate alpha of xt with respect not to the cubature, not with respect to the winner measure, but with respect to the cubature measure. It is as simple as that. All you have to do is solve this OD, you estimate the, the, the value of the, uh, you, you estimate alpha of the final value of the OD and you take the linear combinations of those. Okay, so what do you get if you do that? Well, what, what you will get when you take the difference between this, the quantity that you get, the, the, the difference between the um, expected value of alpha of xt, that means integrate, integrate alpha with respect to the law of x, and compare it with the integrating alpha with respect to the law given by these weighted Dirac measures at these paths, the error that you get is a order delta to the power m minus one over two. So I need to explain what this is. So what you do, you, you can work on the whole interval, zero t, or you can divide this interval into sub-intervals, and then for each of these sub-intervals, you, you can apply the cubature, uh, this, you can solve these ODs, okay? So if you do that, and the mesh, the mesh of the of the, of the partition is delta, then the order that you end up is this. And m is the number of the iterated integrals that you match, okay? So if you just match one, it's bad news. If you just match two, you get a half. If you match three, you get three minus one divided by two, you get order one. So the 
the equivalent of the Euler approximation, an order one method, if you use curvature, what you need to do, you need to match the first three, you have to match all the, the iterated integrals up to order three. So an order one method, if you use curvature methodology, for an order one method, if you use curvature methodology, you have to match all the iterated integrals up to order three. In order to match, in order to obtain an order two method, you have to match all the iterated integrals up to order five, and so on. So when you, when you look at the literature on curvature methods, all you'll see, you'll see, you'll see development of curvature methods of even order, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. And the reason for that is the bound that you obtain is of this form. The bound that you obtain is m, which is the number of iterated integrals that you match, minus one divided by two. Okay, so, so that's what you, uh, this is the error. And of course, now, I'm coming back to Peter's question. Okay, so, okay, so how, many, how many of these paths do you have to take? Well, so in order to get, in order to get an order one method, in other words, in order to, in order to get, uh, you, you need to match the first three iterated sets of iterated integrals. So a curvature of order three can be, so this is not a unique, there's no uniqueness here, but for d equal to one, a curvature of order three is just simply, you have two straight paths going either up or down with probability of half. So you just go up with probability of half straight and down with probability of half, and this is a curvature of order three in dimension d equal to one. So there's two paths, you need two paths. In d dimensions, right, you need this many paths. So you need the integer part of d times d plus two divided by six plus one. So this is, you need this many linear paths in the dimensions to obtain a curvature of order three, to, get, to, to obtain a first order um, approximation. Okay? Now if you want to go up, a curvature of order five for d equal to one, you need three paths. So you need a path which just, just stays zeros, constant, and then you need a path that goes according to this law, and a, pa a path which is minus the first path. So this, this path that is, goes according to this law is, it looks like this. It's piecewise linear. So from zero to a third is a straight path, and then from a third to two thirds, it's, it's another path, and then you get another path from two thirds to one. So it's a piecewise linear path that goes like this, and this is exactly, this is exactly the, the, the pictures that I have in here. So, so, so the three paths, so you stop here. The three paths are, there's a straight one, and there's, there's one which goes up, down, and up, and there's another one that is the reverse of the first one, which goes down, up, and, and down. So you have these three paths, and you'll have to solve the ODE for each of these three paths. Okay? Now, when you, go, when you, get, when you, when you get to the first uh, partition time, what you need to do for each of these points, you have to restart the procedure, and for each of these points, you have to solve the ODE according to the same three paths, but starting from these points. So, you know, if you have three paths here, then you have three times, three times more paths here and so on. Every time you have an element of the partition, you have to multiply the computational effort by three. So you have a computational increase. You have a computational increase in, in the, which depends on the number of elements in, in, in your partition. And that's bad news, right? Because that means, that means that, you know, if I have, you know, 20, if I, if I have a partition which has which has 20, uh, which has 20 uh, points, then I end up with, if I use a curvature of order three, I end up with three to the power of 20 paths that I have to solve. And that's not something which is feasible. So the next step, once, once, I, once I have this curvature measure, so we think of the curvature measure as being a measure on, on this 
set of paths that branch out, keep branching out, then I have to say, okay, I won't be able to, I won't be able to compute the uh, all these for each of these for this, for each of these corresponding paths. So what I need to do, I need to select a subset of these paths and only compute the ODs on this subset of these paths. And I need to find a way in which I can do this selection so that I don't mess up the overall computation. Okay, so the curvature, what the curvature measure does is really, it, it identifies a set of representative paths, but the next step is to say, okay, now this is the representative paths. If I do, if I do this and I just do this integration with respect to the measure on this representative paths, I get this error. I can't compute the ODs over all these representative paths. Therefore, I have to select some of these paths, the most, uh, the one, a, a subset of these paths, depending on, on the amount of computational effort that I have at my disposal, and I will only do the computation on this selection of computational paths. Now, if you're trying to solve a problem on a finite time horizon, uh, you have to use a partition. Uh, and this is where I stopped be before the break. So what's gonna happen is that for each time of the partition, you have to solve all these ODEs and you know, the paths branch out more and more. Now, the, the good news is that because you match the signature, um, you need a lot less elements in the partition compared to what you would have to use if you were to do a, a standard Euler approximation of, of the SDE and then uh, sample from that. Right? So this isn't something that I can prove. This is something that we observe in practice. That you know, if you, you know, the number of points in your partition doesn't have to be equal with the number of points in a partition that you have to use when you, uh, when you use an Euler approximation to solve the SD and then you replace the Brownian motion by, or you, you, you sample from, from the Euler approximation. And nevertheless, you know, especially if you work in high dimensions, you know, even if you have a few points of the partition, the number of, the number of ODs that you have to solve increases exponentially with, uh, uh, with the number of points in the partition. So you have, as I said, you have to find a way in which you uh, take just a sample from this, uh, a sample from this uh, pass. So in order to do that, what, what, what we do, we replace the curvature measure by another measure. So remember, the M here is, tells you how many iterated integrals do I have to solve. So do I have to match? I want to match, okay? And then you have to, for each of these M's, you have to have a number of, you have to solve a number of ODs. The number of ODs is, is depends on the dimension. If you just solve, uh, if you, for, for a curvature of order three, you need, for example, order d squared um, paths if you solve the, if your OD is in d dimension. And then what you do next, you, you replace the curvature measure by another measure, which depends on a second parameter, which is capital N. And the second parameter, parameter will tell you how many, how many of these paths are you actually going to take? Okay, so you do, your, you do your analysis and you find out, actually, all I can afford is to solve a thousand ODs, a million ODs. You know, it depends on your computational effort. And then you say that's, and then this is the number of paths that you will choose. So out of, out of all the paths that you end up, this, that sort of increase exponentially with the number of points in the partition, all you'll do, you'll just pick up capital N pass, where N is, is a parameter which you choose, depending on how much computational effort you afford to uh, use. And in order to do this, in order to do this, what we use, we use something which is called a tree-based branching algorithm, or TBBA, and we, we we introduced this three-page branching algorithm before cubature measures were introduced because this, this wasn't, this wasn't <coughs> introduced in relation with cubature measure. It was, it was introduced uh, in the context of filtering. So the, a three-based branching algorithm is, is simply uh, a, a, 
a methodology that provides optimal stratified sampling, right? So in, in a statistical language, that's what it does. You know, you, you, get, you, you, get a, you get a measure which sits on, on some finite support or countable support, and you sample in some way out of that measure another measure, you get another measure which has a fixed support, or it says a support which is less than your capital N, your choice of, uh, of the number of uh, points, and is, has certain properties. And I'm going to come back to its properties. And so we, th this was introduced in the con concept of filtering, and then we realized that actually this is an ideal methodology in the context of cubiture to keep the computational effort fixed. And in fact, anywhere you see measures that are constructed in this, in this inductive way which involve trees, you can use this methodology to subsample, to sample out of, out of a tree. And so the idea here is that what you use, you don't use the cubature measure itself. You use a subset of this cubature path you combine the cubature measure with the TBBA, and that is going to produce that is going to produce another measure that will have the number of paths fixed to whatever you choose the number of a path to be. So, you know, if I, when I have when I have this cubature path, so I told you that you know, say this is the first point in the partition, and then I have the cubature path. So for each of these cubature path, for each of these three points, I have to reapply the the same the same, I have to attach the same three paths, and then I get nine and, and then 27 and so on. What you do, what, what the TBBA does, it's, it, the, the TBBA, it's fixed. It, it chooses only some of these paths, and it solves the ODEs only along some of these paths. Okay, so, you know, the, the paths that are in the cubature measure, but are not selected, you do not need to solve the ODE, you know, you don't, you don't care about those paths, all, all you care is, about the paths that are selected. So first, so what you do, you first select the paths, and then you solve the ODE, not the other way around. That means that truly this is, you keep the computational effort fixed. So how do you do that? Well, <coughs> essentially you use something which is a Monte Carlo method, more or less, but it's stratified. And the idea, the idea behind it is, is that you think of having a number of particles that start a number of n particles that start here, you know, you think of the n particles start here at the, at, the, at, the, at the root of your tree, and these particles trickle down across the branches in a certain way that at each level, at each, at, at each level, the empirical distribution of the occupation, the, the occupation measure of these particles will approximate the original, will approximate the original cubicle measure. And the, the, uh, the law, the law, sorry, I, I made a mistake. So, so the law of, um, of the mass that the cubature, the mass the, that this truncated cubicle puts on each, on each uh, path is given by this formula. I'm not going to go through it, but I, all, I only want to mention is that it's, choose, it's chosen, the mass that it puts on each of these paths is chosen so that it approximates the corresponding lambda i, the corresponding cubicle weights to within one over n. And that's the important thing. So, so it, it tries, so this, the, the TBBA truncates the cubicle measure so that it gets as close as possible to it, to within one over n of the actual weight of that path. So remember, each path has a weight, right? So I have paths and weights. And as I go along down the cubicle, Three, these weights multiply. So for each for each of these paths, I, I have a corresponding weight, okay. And when I select my paths, I select my paths by taking into account these weights, okay. So I want to select at most n of these paths in such a way that I come as close as as I can to the corresponding weight within one over n of the corresponding weight. So that's this is the formula that is, is done in here. Okay, so the remaining paths, for the remaining paths, each one of the remaining paths will have a corresponding weight, right? Each one of the corresponding paths will have a corresponding weight. 
and it's going to be a probabilist, uh, uh, probability measure on the path in itself. So the sum of all these weights will still make, will still be one. The sum of all these weights will still be one. So I still deal with a probability measure. So the, tr you know, when I when I apply, after I apply the TBBA, I'm left with a subset of paths. For each of these paths, I'll have a corresponding weight, and the sum of all these weights is still going to be one. So I still will deal with uh, with a probability measure, and. Then all I need to do is just solve the ODE according, according to each of these remaining paths and apply the same methodology, you know, take the sum of the alpha estimated at the end of the solution of the ODE driven by the path multiplied by the corresponding uh, cubicle uh, weight perturbed in the way in which is presented here. Okay, so the algorithm is really, uh, you know, there's a, the, it's there. It's not very difficult to, yeah. So is there an analogy to uh, particle filters that you, you could see your paths, that you kill some of your paths, so you set the weights to zero, but you have to reweight all other weights, so you present yeah, them as... Yeah, there is. And then okay. I'm going to hope to come and show you the application to, to, to filters. Okay, so... You know, the algorithm, if you go and look in the paper, you see the algorithm written down in pseudocode. You can apply the algorithm. There's no problem with, with it. And this, this algorithm has some amazing properties in the sense of it, it has minimal variance. So, you know, if, if of all the measures that approximate a measure such as this, um, it minimizes the variance of any, for any individual size. So it has lots of nice properties. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say which is generic and applies to all the examples that follow next. So I've told you, I've told you how you approximate the winner measure, and I also told you how you limit, how you control the computational effort. And now I'm going to go and look at three different examples, three different classes of PDs or SPDs, where this methodology is applied. And for each of these things, what's going to be different is, of course, I'll have a corresponding uh, Feynman Kahn representation was, as, as Rene is telling me, I should call it a Kakutani representation, but there you are. Um, I have to tell you what the representation is, how I discretize that, and then what is going to be common to each one of these three will be the fact that for each one of these three, I'm using the cubicle me method combined with the TBBA. Okay, so example no number one, semilinear PDs. Okay, so we'll look at the, at the semilinear PD that looks like this. Okay, so it has the final condition, which is phi. I have here a second order differential operator, okay, which is written like this. So, so, so these VIs here are first order differential operators. So I'm writing, I'm writing them in, in this format, okay. So I have a first order differential operator here, and then I add to this a sum. Here I have first order differential operator applied twice. Okay, so this is essentially a second order differential operator. And the reason why I write it like this is because it's going to be easier to write the corresponding Feynman Kahn representation in terms of, uh, of the solution of an SDE um, written in, with, with Stratonovich integrals. Okay, so this is a second order uh, differential operator, linear operator, which applies to you. And then here, this is where the similarity comes. So the similarity is in terms of a function which is in, in the contents of four backwards D, this is called the driver, a function which can depend on time, the underlying variable, the solution, and these operators VIs that are applied to you. Okay, so the nonlinearity can be in this format. Okay? Now, if this seems to be too complicated, I'm just gonna give you a particular example and then just keep this example in mind. So a particular case, is to say, okay, let's not worry about this very complicated operator. Let's just replace it with uh, the Laplacian. So I have delta t plus the Laplacian applied to, uh, partial of t Laplacian applied to u. And then the normality, the normality is going to be in terms of u and the gradient of u. Okay, so this is a particular case which, be, which belongs to this, this wider class. And I have a final condition. Okay, so 
what we're doing here, we, we, we have a corresponding Feynman Kaiser presentation, and then we're going to use the cubature measure to approximate uh, the solution of this equation. Right. So, what is the Feynman Kaiser presentation? Well, the Feynman Kaiser presentation in this particular case for a semi linear uh, uh, PD is in terms of a four backward SD. So let me explain briefly what this is. So what you have, a four backward SD has two parts. One is a four part, the four component. You start from some value x naught at time zero, and you simply solve, this is a, is a classical stochastic differential equation, which is solved forward in time, where the v's that you saw before appearing here are just coefficients. So I have a drift term, and then I have a, a stochastic term, which is written in terms of a Stratonovich integration with respect to a Brownian motion, a d-dimensional Brownian motion, and the vi's that you saw there appear here as coefficients in the stochastic integral. Okay, so this is the four component of the four backward SD, and then is, you have a backward component, and the backward component, you start at the final time capital T with some function of the four component estimated at, the cap, at capital T, and the way you interpret this, you know, you, sort, you solve backward in time, you solve this backward in time, and you have a drift term which is in, term, is, which is in terms of this driver that you saw in the semilinearity in the, uh, in the, um, in the semilinear PD, and then you have a stochastic term here, which is, a sto is, which is an integral, which is an Ito integral. But you have an additional term in here, z, which is a sort of the mystery guest. Um, so this z here is essentially part of your solution, right? So the solution is going to be made out of, will have three components. The x, the four component, the y, the back of component, and the z, which is this, this, uh, this term in here, which appears in the stochastic integral, right? And the reason why I have to impose this is because even though you think of running the backward component backwards in time, you impose the constraint that the backward component is measurable forwards in time. So it's measurable with respect to the forward filtration generated by the Brownian motion. And the only way in which you can do that is, is to have this, this freedom of choosing this additional process Z. Okay, so, so the famous theorem by, introduced by, proved by Fardo and Peng in the 1990 is that if you, if you have a system that is introduced in this way, there exists a triplet of processes X, Y, and Z that uniquely, that are a solution of this, uh, of this system, and the solution is unique. Okay, so what's the connection now between this system and my same linear PDE? And it's again part of the thing that came out and say, okay, so suppose that you take your solution, the four backward SD that I've just shown you, and you start, you start at time t, you start at time t from x, and you solve the system forward from time t up to the final time capital T. So at time s, this is going to be the expression for uh, this is one of the expression for the four component. So it's, you know, this is the flow. This is the flow, the stochastic flow associated with my four component. And then you go at time capital T, you look, you take the function, the final condition estimated at the solution of the four component at time capital T that started from time X at time little d. And then you run backward in time according to the backward component. And you run it up to time little t where you started. Then this quantity in here, so again, this doesn't mean that I have a process that at time t, because I index the process with t and x, doesn't mean that y t, 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 x is equal to x. It doesn't mean that. It simply means that I, I, I compute this guy by starting with the four component at time x, you go to the final time, and then you go backwards in time, back to the time little t with the backward component in this way. So this, this quantity here gives you exactly the representation of the solution of the semilinear PD. So you, the solution of the semilinear PD, 
at time t estimated that x is exactly equal to this quantity. And you can prove that this is a deterministic, this is deterministic even though you think that actually it's, 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 it's random. And so by taking the expected value of this quantity in here, the stochastic integral disappears and you have this expression, you have this expression here in terms of all the elements that appear in there, in terms of the four component, in terms of the backward component, and in terms of z, this mystery process in there. But there's more. The, the, both the backward component and the z, you can show that these quantities are functions of the four component. So essentially, even though this looks very complicated, this is a nonlinear Feynman Kass representation for the solution of the semilinear PD. And that's it. I have my Feynman Kass representation. I then can go on and apply my methodology to solve it, right? So the next step that I need to do is to discretize. So this is what I'm saying in here. Okay, I have a way to represent the solution of the semilinear PD in terms of a Feynman Kass representation, and then I can start to discretize it. And I'm explaining, I'm explaining in here how you discretize it. What we use here, we, we used um, the, the methodology, a methodology which, which was introduced by Boucher and Truzzi. You know, this is simply sort of a discretization of the functional. I can't go through the details of it because I, I'm running out of time. Uh, but you know, there's a there's a standard discretization that you, you use to uh, you need to do, and then you when you what you what you prove you prove that if you apply this discretization you, you, if if you apply this algorithm, so before you do any cubature ap uh, approximations or anything like that, when you apply this, the error that you get is either order either of order delta or of order square root of delta, depending on conditions that you impose on, on the coefficients. Okay, so the discretization that, that, that I've just shown you, briefly shown you, you can use any other discretization. This discretization is not unique, and there are a lot of other discretizations are, uh, out there. This discretization is order one. So the best that we'll be hoping to do is to end up with an approximation of order one. So it's, it's order one because it's delta to the power one. Okay, so in order to match the cubic, the corresponding measure that will match this will be to use a cubature measure of order three. Three minus one divided by two is one. I, I can use a higher order cubatures, but it's not gonna be helpful for me because I I, the, my discretization, the, my error is gonna be dominated by the way in which I uh, discretize the, the uh, functional. But I, there are, there are high order discretization, and you might want to look at uh, the paper uh, Jean-Francois and I uh, uh, produced when you can get basically discretization of any order. So that's how you discretize, and once you discretize that, all you have to do, you have to apply the methodology. In order to solve the, in order to, <coughs> instead of solving the forward SD, you solve all these ODs, you compute the chorus, you, you subsample use, using the TBBA, and then you compute the corresponding uh, the discretize, the, you compute the discretized form, functional integrate with respect to this truncated uh, cubature measure, and the result that you end up is the following. So <clears throat> there should be a one over two in here. Let me assume. So the the L two norm of this is is controlled by three terms. Okay, and then this is where you see exactly which error, what 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 each of these three states, how each of these three states influence the error. So the first point here, the first one here, this is delta. So this, is come, this comes as a result of using a first order discretization of the functional. Now you may want, you, you can do better than this. You know, you can use a high order discretization and then you get a better approximation in, 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 for, for this first error. And then the next one depends on which cubature measure you're gonna take. So if you take a cubature measure uh, of order three, then you get another delta, we can go higher. You take cubature measure of order five and so on, and you can have a better approximation, but with more computational effort. And then the third one is an error as a result of trying to control the computational effort. And this is one over n, or square root of n if I put the square root of n in there. So you, know, you, can, see, you can see clearly 
you know, each one of these three steps will, will, will involve an error. Okay, so a quick example, you know, we, we, we just prove, we just got this same linear PD where, you know, we, we got sort of, you will recognize this as coming from a geometric Brownian motion, and then we, we took, a, we took a, a, a driver which looks like this, and a final, uh, a final condition which is of this form, um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you, you will, you, will uh, you know, you can't see this very well, but the point is uh, that as you increase the number of particles, so particles by particles I mean capital N, as you increase the number of terms, and then you get better and better approximations, the error decays. Um, and this is done for cubature of order three and cubature of order five. And the computational effort, so, so it, you know, it, you, if you do a certain averaging over independent runs of applying the TBBA, you get a better result because you, you reduce the variance and you get a much better error. The error is sort of of, of order 0.01, the relative error. And it, it is in here that I'm trying to show that because of the fact that you keep because of the, of the fact that you keep now the computational effort fixed for each element of the partition, as you increase the number of elements in the partition, the computational effort increases linearly. So there's no explosion in the computational effort, even though it did look at this the first time that I have an explosion. Okay, another example. So I'm gonna now go and look at the, what happens in, in filtering, and this is, you know, the. In, in filtering, I've been working in filtering for a number of years, so there's this methodology that produces an approximation of the solution of the filtering problem in terms of the occupational measure of uh, a set of particles. You have, you'll have particles that, moves, that move through space and, uh, and they produce an approximation of the filtering problem. So the equation that you solve in this case is is written here in, in weak form, but if you, want, if you want the strong form of this equation, a particular case, again, similar to what I told you before, so you, you have a drift term which you can take to be taken to be just the Laplacian, and then you have a stochastic term which is a sum of integrals with respect to a Brownian motion. This isn't the Brownian motion that appears in my cubature uh, in my cubature measure. This is another Brownian motion, so it has a, it's a Brownian motion which is independent of the first one. And it's, the noise is multiplicative in the sense that I multiply the noise, the, the Brownian motion, with the solution itself, and I multiply this with some gamma k, and the gamma k's are functions themselves. And I can see I'm rapidly running out of time, so I'm just gonna sort of show you quickly, quickly the feynman kass representation looks like this. So there is a feynman kass representation for this. And the connection with the filtering problem is that that linear SPD, that linear SPD is, is used in the context of filtering where the X in here, the X in here is a process that I like to estimate. So X in here is a process which you call the signal and is the solution of an SD, and what I have, I, I observe X. I have, I, how do I observe X? I, 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 I observe a function of X to which I add noise which is, which is modeled by another Brownian motion. And then if I solve this, the, the, the solution of this equation will give me, will give me the solution of the, uh, the solution of the, um, the solution of the Zakai equation Normalized, properly normalized, gives me the solution of uh, the, signal, the, the, the filtering problem. And I need now to go to the simulation. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. So, what you'll see next, you will see a simulation which, where you see the evolution of, the, uh, of some particles 
each of the particles evolves according to one of those ODEs. What I'm choosing, I'm choosing 5,000 particles. So I'm, I'm, at each time, I'm solving 5,000 ODEs, okay? And I select these ODEs, I select which particles I'm gonna use by using the TBBA, right? So the particles evolve according to the ODEs that are dictated to me by the cubature measure. Exactly which ODEs I'm gonna solve, I'm, gonna, I'm using the TBBA to decide which ODEs I'm gonna solve. So let me just, I'll start running this. Okay, so, so what you've seen here, so first of all, there's, there's several things that we need, you need to look at. The, the solution of the Zakai equation, the solution they, that I, I need to estimate, let me start it from the beginning, is the green, the green curve in here. So if you look, if you look carefully, I hope you can see there is a green curve in here, right? It's a bimodal thing. It's a bimodal thing. You know, the, 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 the filtering problem, the solution of the Zakai equation has two modes. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, so there is a, you know, there are equations, SPDs out there, that have an explicit solutions that, that are bimodal. You know, you can, you can end up with multimodal ones, but this one, is by model. So your, your particles, they have to approximate this bimodal distribution, but they do much more than that. They approximate not just the distribution of the any time t, they approximate the distribution on the path space. This is a much better approximation on the path space, but what you see here, you just see the approximation at any time t. Okay, so what I intend, so the intention is to approximate this bimodal distribution which eventually becomes unimodal in the sense of the, the second mode is, is, is still there, but is very, very flat. Now, in the, in, the, in the context of filtering, the reason for that is that, you know, as I observe, as I make more and more observations, I find out where my signal is. So my signal is, is given by this triangle in here. The actual position where the, of the signal is given by this triangle, but the posterior distribution, the observations, by using the observation, I am not able to find out exactly where the signal is. All I'm able to do is to compute the conditional distribution of the signal given the observation. And at the, at the beginning, I'm not doing a very good job, not because I can't, because, you know, because I can't, in the sense of the, the, the posterior distribution is truly bimodal. The blue thing here is the actual distribution of the signal without taking into account any observations. So if you were to just use the, the blue thing, you'll go completely wrong, because the blue thing simply says that, well, the signal can be either in one place and, or the other place, but I don't know which one it is. So, but in, when, I, when I start using the observations, then I know, I begin to know where the signal is gonna be. The particles themselves, are represented in here by these straight lines in here. So you can see there, there's some very narrow straight lines. Each of these straight lines is the position of the particles. So you look, so, so the whole cloud of particles start by being very concentrating. They split into two bits, right? I solve all these, I solve all these, but you know, eventually I, I go down one route and then I, I don't continue that route. You know, the whole mass moves into another, onto another ODE that becomes more relevant, and this ODE continues, and that, that ODE doesn't continue. So the particles themselves, they just move from one place to another, depending on how the TBBA tells them to move. Okay, and so all the time, I have a number of surviving particles that, that solves this, they solve this ODE, and only the, the, the one that survive what I, do, I do, what I do with them, I just compute uh, the, comp the corresponding empirical distribution of this, and that's, that's what I get, the red thing is gonna give me that. So essentially, I solve, th this methodology shows how I can use the cubicle measure to solve the uh, SPD in the context of the filtering problem. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now and I only have a few minutes left. Uh, so,
I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you this result. So again, this result here, again, tells you what the error, the error is gonna be depending on the various parameters. So, so the, error, the error depends on how good of a job I do to discretize the functional. So it's one over n to the power, if, if, if one over n is the order of the mesh of my discretization, one over n to the power alpha is, is the error that I get by discretizing the functional. Now this alpha, it's a most one. With existing methodology, with existing methodology, we cannot get better than uh, one. We're trying very hard now to go to two, okay? Then the next one depends on m. m is the order of the curvature, and again, is one over n to the power m minus one over two. So, you know, you can just work with curvature of order three, it'll be okay. And one over n is essentially depends on how many uh, cubature paths you're allowed to use. So if each of the three steps induces a corresponding, induces a corresponding error, which can be computed in terms of the corresponding parameters. Okay, so let me not go into this. I want to go, because you know, this mean field, this is about mean field. So <clears throat> I'm just gonna say a, a, a couple of things about the third example. So for this third example, you, you have a nonlinear diffusion that looks like this. So, so, what you, what, so the corresponding, the corresponding uh, PDE, so I'm, I'm writing about the corresponding PDE is, is nonlinear in the sense of these VIs in here, these differential operators that you saw before, right? apply to the solution, they are, they are applied to the solutions. These, these VI in, VIs in here depend on the solution itself. That's why it's nonlinear. So the VIs depend on, obviously on X, on the variable, on the independent variable, but they also depend on the integral of some function phi, some function phi, integrated with respect to the solution of the semilinear PD. So this is truly a nonlinear PD in that the coefficients themselves depend on the, on the solution. So if you now want to compute the, you have, you want, want, if you now want to compute the corresponding feynman katz representation, the corresponding feynman katz representation is gonna be given in terms of a nonlinear diffusion. So now what you'll have, you'll have to have a stochastic flow where the coefficients, obviously each of the coefficients depend on, well, the solution, the flow itself, but they also depend on some expected value of some functional of the solution itself. So what you have in here, you have an integral of phi with respect to the law of the process itself. The, the, so the, the diffusion, the linear diffusion, the direction in which the nonlinear diffusion is gonna go is dictated not just by the position that the diffusion has at a certain time, but, by the entire, but also by the entire law of the diffusion. So this is a mckim vlasov SD or a nonlinear diffusion. So we have some conditions under which this work, this, this is done, and we've used two, method, two, two, two sets of methodology to discretize the, uh, to discretize the, uh, uh, the functional, and we have a result that we proved last year, and the paper is still waiting to appear, which depends, which depends on many, many parameters. I'm not gonna go into these details. Uh, Imon has gone into a lot of trouble to compute these errors, depending on all the parameters that appear in there. So let me not go into that, these details. So a, a simple example that we uh, looked at was to take a nonlinear diffusion, where in here the drift is given by the law, by the expected value of the diffusion itself. And the reason why you chose this plus barrier motion, the reason why you chose this is that you can compute this explicitly. There's an explicit uh, comp uh, expression of this um, and is given by this. And we use that and we show that obviously it's gonna work because otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking to you. And we also looked at a more complicated situation where <coughs> the coefficients are not uniformly elliptic. Um, it's a two dimensional case and again, in this case, the, the, the whole methods, the, the whole methodology still works. Okay, so let me conclude with some final remarks. 
I made a case here that you can use Feynman Kass representations to represent a variety of PDEs, a variety of solutions of PDEs and SPDs. And once you have such representation, then you can begin to either analyze them theoretically or numerically approximate them. If you use the Feynman Kass representation to numerically approximate uh, the solution of these PDEs or SPDs, you have to, you, you have these three steps that you need to use. Step number one, you need to discretize the functional. Now, this, discretizing the functional, this is a problem specific uh, question. For each of these PDEs, you have to look at the corresponding functionals, functional and find a way to discretize it and compute the corresponding uh, error. The other two steps are not depending on the problem. They are common to all the, to all the methodologies. And the reason why they are common is that each of these Feynman Kass representation essentially is a representation in the form of an expected value of a functional with respect to the winner measure. And all, all, everything that you do is just replace the winner measure with a cubature measure. And I've, I've explained how you, how you dis do this discretization using the cubature measure. And then the third step that you need to impose is to essentially reduce this, the, the cubature, su the support of the cubature measure to a support that you choose to use, and then this will, this, you can do this by, the, by using the tree-based branching algorithm, and then you compute correspondingly the, the error that <coughs> this induces. So you have to put all of these three methods together, three, three steps together to get an approximation of the solution, a probabilistic, an approximation of the solution of the, um, of the PD or SPD based on the Feynman Kass representation, which means it's a probabilistic method. Now, the cubature measure, uh, method is essentially deterministic. I solve all these. I solve a set of all these. So each of these particles, the kind of particles that you've seen in the, in the filtering application, you solve an ODE. Okay? And you use this, the corresponding paths to represent the cubature, uh, uh, to represent cubature measure and they approximate the winner measure. The TPBA is not deterministic. The TPBA is, is, a, is a random method that selects, in a judicious way, n paths out of the paths that give you the cubicular method. There, are, there is another set of methodology that is not de uh, random, is deterministic, and this, is, this was introduced uh, by Lyons and collaborators, which is called the recombination method. So a recombination method tries to do the same thing, but deterministically, where you, know, you reassign the paths in a deterministic way, okay? By using the TBBA, there is not going to be any exponential increase in the number of paths. The number of paths remains constant to the number of paths to, to, to uh, the number of paths that you decide. And you know, if you put all of these, th these things together, you get an approximation, right? For for any PDE for which you have a Feynman Kass representation, and I I hope that this will eventually lead to a, a theory of approximation that can be applied in general. So you, know, you can envisage a situation where one day you come there, you give your approximation, you give a Feynman Kass representation to your uh, Maple or to your Mathematica, and this is underneath you have all this mach machinery and it's just gonna spit out the approximation. Thank you very much. So um, how does your method degenerate as the diffusion, uh, if it goes to zero, suppose you have a low diffusion limit, somehow, for example, take a heat equation and plus some drift terms and expect some transport equation to be the limiting case when epsilon goes to zero, when the diffusion. So how does the method degenerate? You, how, how do you see this um, kind of uh, lack of uh, the diffusion in, in your methods. I expect right. this would be related somehow to this uh, home under condition definition. Yes. Yeah, so you've given the answer. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so uh, you have, you know, this, this set of methods, uh, they, they work under the home under condition. They work under a condition which is called the UFG condition, which is weaker than the home under condition, but still, you know, there's some sort of non-degeneracy that the corresponding differential operator will have to satisfy 
to make these methods work. So this non-degeneracy will means that will, will, means that this this uh, uh, this the corresponding ODEs will stay in the in the support of the diffusion, right? But sort of somehow the the, the diffusion itself has to be at least on the support it has to be well defined. You know, you have to fill out the the support of the diffusion. Now, if you have a situation in which the you know you have the you know you, you hit like you, you take the CIR. You know, it, hit, it hits zero, it's not going to be satisfied. So the method is going to degenerate exactly because you know, the, the corresponding condition fails. So you see this exactly, you, know, you, you can do the approximation, and I can, I, 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 there's lots of tricks of the trade that you can use. You, know, you can use a more refined, you can use a more refined, locally refined partition, and you can compute these things locally so that you can avoid that. That's, you can do you know, the same thing that you do with standard solutions of ODEs or SDs, you can do it here. Um, but you know, generically, you know that in the limit, if you just want to try to use to, to, to approximate the limiting equation, you will fail. I see. Because ultimately, you might want to recover the characteristics method when this. Uh, I don't know if you, you see what I mean, but uh, ultimately, in, when you're doing Feynman cuts, you are doing a sum over all characteristics for a, a parabolic equation. Yeah? And when this parabolicity disappears, you, and perhaps you have some kind of hyperbolicity left, you might be able to recover the characteristic method. So I was wondering. Right. So, so you know. <laughs> It's all to do with the UFG condition. So there's no longer the Hormann, the question of the Hormann condition is a question of the UFG condition. So what you need to do, you need to adapt the feynman kars representation, approximate the representation so that you use something which solves the UFG condition, and then you apply it to those. Yeah. Okay. When you say you approximate on the path space, mm -hmm. does it mean that you approximate this function u everywhere at the same time? or? Starting point per starting point. You approximate this function starting point per starting point, but you can do these things. You know that, that, that there is a way that you can, you know, ah. do these things together. Ah, okay. okay. So, but I mean, this is simply, you know, the feynman kars approximation simply yes. gives you a representation of the solution at time t estimated at point x. So that's what you do. Okay. Another question: Can you do it with jumps? Sorry. Can you deal with jumps? OK. <clears throat> if you asked me this question last week, <laughs> I, I would have said no. But yesterday, I was in Durham, and Vlad Bali gave a talk which sort of where he, he showed that you can, have, you can have equations where you have an additional, you have a jump term, and there is a way to approximate the small jumps with an integral respect to Brownian motion. It's an amazing thing. So somehow, out of these small jumps, you can approximate these small jumps with an integral respect to Brownian motion, and you are left only with the big jumps. And as a result of that, you can, I think, now, the answer that I can give you, the answer is yes, if you do this additional approximation, you place all these small jumps, there's lots of them, we're using an integral respect to Brownian motion, and then you apply the same methodology. L large jumps are already OK. The large jump, I mean, the, the large jump is you know, it's just sort of, Yes. Get the jumps, and then you go up to the jump, and then you jump, and then there's not a problem. Large jumps, there's, there's, a, there's a finer number of large jumps. You know, there won't be a lot of the large jumps. If you know what to do in between them, you're going to be OK. <clears throat> but if you really want to do the cubature measure with jumps, so without doing this trick, then this has not been done. So maybe students out there can come and say, well, OK, now let's try and approximate not the winner measure, but you know, a measure that accepts jump. And then you can repeat the whole methodology and have jumps. Thank you. OK, so the last quick question. So we try to keep to the schedule. Uh, OK, so I wanted to ask, to what sort of problems it is preferable to apply cubature method compared to alternatives? That's a hard question. <laughs> you have to test it. That's all I'm, I'm uh, suggesting. Your experience. You know, we, we, so, when we came up with when we came up with the uh, first methodology for semilinear PDs, we sort of try and look ve at various other alternative methods that were there, and of course we try to show that this is better on the examples that we looked at. 
but it may be that you come up with different examples where it's not going to be working, it's not going to be better. You know, for example, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we learned of a new method that can be used to uh, uh, solve some of the semilinear PDs in 100 dimensions. And then you, know, you have a whole lot of questions, and now you can try to try and see if you can do this in 100 dimensions. But there is not a universal answer. This is a generic methodology which you can use to try if it's going to work or not for the problem of your choice. Yeah, but for example, in high dimension, does it work uh, efficiently? Exactly. So this is the questions that we face now. So up until the week before last week, everybody was doing semilinear PDs in dimension up to 7, 10, and so on. Okay, so of course we can do semilinear PDs in dimension up to 7, 10, and so on. But now last week, the two weeks ago, we learned that you can do semilinear PDs in dimension 100. And now this is the challenge. We have to try and see if this is going to work in dimension 100. But the, but the methodology is still there. You know how to, the Kubitschel measure, measure is going to be in dimension 100. You know how to control this by using the, the, the computational effort. And you just have to test to see if it's going to work. Okay, um, so I think we shouldn't be that optimistic about 100-dimensional PDs just yet. <laughs> but let's thank uh, Dan again. Yeah.